in this video, we're going to be looking at how to sketch polar curves. So let us begin by telling you that any polar curve is going to be written as a function of theta. So we're going to have r is equal to f of theta for some theta. Now, there are a couple curves we're going to do right off the bat, which is going to be r is equal to 2 and r is equal to 1. What do we know about polar curves? Well, each point on a polar curve is written as a pair, r and theta, where r is the distance away from the origin, and theta is the angle away from this zero radian line. r equals 2 implies that the radius is 2 from the origin at every point, and there's no specific theta we have to draw it at, so what we get is this nice circle where the distance is always going to be 2. Now what does that mean if we have to draw the graph of r equals 1? That just means that we're going to have a smaller circle with a distance of 1. And as you can see, this is a very, very efficient way and a very simple function in polar coordinates as opposed to saying that x squared plus y squared is equal to 1. Instead of saying that, we can say that r is equal to 1. Isn't that so much faster? In fact, this really is 1 squared, so we can say that 1 is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared, which we actually have solved and know that this is the exact same thing as r. So there's a little proof if you need it but I don't think you need it. I think it is fairly intuitive to see that just having the polar coordinates for these very basic circular graphs are much more effective. And when solving integrals, areas, uh, tangent lines, which I won't be covering, but all those sort of things can be done really quickly with polar curves. Now, we did one where we have a radius. Let's sketch when theta is equal to pi over 4. Again, we have our theta as a set of coordinates. Now pi over 4 is going to be the angle at which all the points are. And we're not looking at any specific distance. So what that means is that we have to draw all distances. Therefore, this line here is a theta equal to pi over 4. Now, coincidentally, this happens to be the same line as y equals x. And I actually encourage you to verify this yourself. I won't be doing that because I just need to cover the basics, but I would highly recommend you verify that for yourself. And that is exactly why I chose this value. Now, moving on, we're going to do something a little bit more complicated. We're going to sketch the graph of r equals to cosine of theta. What I recommend doing is drawing a little line like this and filling out what the graph of cosine theta does, what the function does. We know that it starts off at 1, and as we go to pi over 2, it is going to hit 0. When it goes to pi, it's going to be negative 1. At 3 pi over 2, it'll be 0, and at 2 pi, it'll come back up to 1. So we get a function that looks like this. Now how do we translate that over to a graph? Well, we have some points on this graph. We have pi over 2 up here. We have 3 pi over 2 down here. We have pi here, and we have 2 pi slash 0 at this point. At 0, we're going to have it at this point 1. And as we move towards pi over 2, so as our angle moves this way, we're going to get closer and closer to the point zero. What happens is we have a graph that looks a little bit like this. Okay, well, that is not too bad. It could be a lot worse. Now let's continue as we go forward. 
Okay, well, when we start going to pi, we're going to end up negative. Now, what happens here? Well, if we were to follow the line, in fact, I'm going to follow the line here, or this is a nice point of zero, we would end up something like this. However, because this is negative, this has to be reflected in this lovely y equals x axis here. Because really what we're doing is we're just reflecting it. We're going negative instead. So we'll end up looking like this as we get to pi. As we move to 3 pi over 2, we're going to be working in this area. But once again, it is going to be negative. So we're going to end up getting this same line again that's on top. And similarly, when we work in this quadrant over here, we're going to be getting this line, which is happens to be the same line we did the second time. So when we go negative, really the positive values are going to be here and the negative values are going to come out the other side. So when we went negative, we just had to go in the opposite quadrant because the values and distance were negative. Now, that might not have made too much sense in the first example, but I think this more challenging example will show things a little bit better. Now we have r is equal to cosine of 2 theta, which means things are happening twice as fast. When I draw our little sketch here, we're going to have things happening twice as fast, so our curve is going to look a little bit like this. Let's just begin. I should draw some very important points here. We have a pi over 4 here. We have a 3 pi over 4 at this point. And that's all I'm going to draw for now. Let's start at 0. So we're going to have a distance of 1. As we move to pi over 4, it is going to get closer and closer to 0 until we reach this point. Now, as we move to pi over 4 and start heading towards pi over 2, we're going to go to negative 1. So instead of working in this quadrant up here, we have to put our values in this quadrant down here because the values are negative. All right. So this will go to negative 1, which means we're going to end up at this point right here. Now, we're going to end up working in this quadrant, but because the values are negative, we need to flip over the side and work in this quadrant down here. Therefore, we're going to get a curve that looks a little bit like this, that tends to zero as we start motioning towards pi, which here is pi. And now when we continue doing this, and I Hope you check this for yourself. We're going to be making a nice four-leafed clover or a four-petal flower, and we'll have a beautiful graph that looks like this. Now, this is not something that is very easily produced in Cartesian coordinates. Can you think of a function y is equal to f of x that can do something like that. Not really. What about a function y is equal to g of t and x is equal to f of t that we did in parametric curves? Again, not the easiest thing to imagine. We have this used for polar coordinates to do beautiful things like this. There are other graphs you can do. In fact, if you have a sine function with an even period, or an, sorry, an odd period, you will get graphs that end up looking like this. So we have these odd shaped leaves. We can also get uh, cardioids, which look like this, little hearts. In fact, they can be on their side, depending on the graph. There are tons of different graphs you can do with polar coordinates, and I definitely suggest 
Googling polar coordinates, seeing some of the graphs you can do, and checking out a few other things. I'll give you a couple things you can sketch. I'm not going to do them, mainly because it is quite a bit of work to do this, and this isn't the best place for me to be graphing. I need some nice polar, polar coordinate graphing template or something for me to do things nicely, which I couldn't find, unfortunately. But this stuff really isn't too bad. I really suggest grabbing a textbook and just drilling out every single value that you can. But r is equal to 2 sine of theta. We haven't done a sine theta yet, and you should check to see how the amplitude changes things. Hint, it doesn't really change it at all. We'll do r is equal to 1 plus sine theta. This will get you an interesting shape. In fact, if you do r is equal to 1 plus cosine theta, you will also see another interesting shape. In fact, you can increase this value to get perhaps even more warped shapes than you normally would. If you have a graph that looks like this, by increasing this value here, the 1, you can get graphs that end up looking like that. You can play around with this to see what you get. And just for fun, try a nice odd powered sine function. See what you get there. It might look kind of nice. That was polar curves. I'm not going to touch anything more on this, mainly because a lot of calc courses don't even touch this until calculus 2. Uh, there'll be a bit in calc 2 about this with areas, which, um, I don't know if I'm going to explain drawing more, because you don't really need to know how to draw it, you just sort of need to know very, very basic primitive drawings, even more so basic than I did here. In Calc 3 it might be a little bit more useful, but uh, po if I need polar curves in a, in a greater sense, I'll cover that in Calculus 2. If not, well, it'll be covered eventually in some series of mine. Don't you worry about that. Anyways, there's only one more lesson in Calculus 1, and that's antiderivatives. It's basically the intro to Calculus 2, except we call it Calculus 1 because we want to make this giant cliffhanger for you guys and be like, oh, I'm drooling at the mouth for some more calculus. And doesn't really ever happen like that. Oh well. I'll see you guys when we cover our last lesson, video 41, antiderivatives.